a very warm welcome. I hope that all are safe and strong in this pandemic scenario. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and being here. I'm Dr. Donna, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. The World Health Organization has declared anti antimicrobial resistance as one of the top 10 global public health prior priorities or threat. Antimicrobial resistance is a challenge that demands attention from health partners across all levels. The development of antimicrobials are some of, moder some of the modern medicine's greatest success. But now we are facing something different, termed as antimicrobial resistance. It is driven by the overuse of antimicrobials in people, animals, and the environment. The question is, is it controllable? And the answer is yes. Optimum use of antibiotics is the key to prevent and control the emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistance. In this regard, the preventive team is organizing the webinar, Antimicrobial Resistance and Strategies to Tackle the Problem. Preventive Risk Management and Prevention of Antibiotic Resistance is a three-year project co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Commission. This webinar is conducted as part of the dissemination activities of the project. Next slide, please, sir. To enlighten us on this topic, we have a very special guest with us, Dr. Sujit J. Chandi. Dr. Sujit J. Chandi is a professor at the Department of Pharmacology and Clinical Pharmacology, Christian Medical College, Bello. He is also director of React Asia Pacific, a node of React, a global network that has been dedicated towards the cause of tackling antibiotic resistance since the year 2005. Dr. Chandi has been working in the area of antibiotic use since 2000 and is currently serving on the WHO Strategic and Technical Advisory Group for AMR and the WHO CRO Task Force for AMR. Next slide, sir. After attending this webinar, attendees will be able to gain insight into the impact of antimicrobial resistance and understand antibiotic policy guidelines in hospital and their usefulness. Participants will also be able to know more about the broader community stewardship strategies needed to tackle AMR. The webinar is being conducted on Zoom and we are directly streaming it on YouTube. If you have a question for our speaker, please type your question in the chat box. While typing a question, please begin by typing hashtag AskPreventIt so that we will understand that these are the questions you want to ask our speaker. We will try to address all questions towards the end of the session and we are keeping aside 15 minutes for the same. I would also like to add that this webinar is being recorded so whoever is not able to attend the live session will be able to listen to it later. The session will be posted on the official website of Prevendit and also on the Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn pages of the project. And last, we would like to encourage you to share today's webinar with your social networks. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Sujit J. Chandi. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Donna, and for those kind words of introduction and the opportunity to speak at the prevented uh, webinar. Um, it's indeed a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, I would, I know that, you know, many people are now familiar with this whole issue of antimicrobial resistance, but nevertheless, we need to realize that um, in spite of more awareness and more, um, let's say, activities towards tackling it, somehow the problem has not decreased. It seems to be increasing. So I would like to spend some time with you um, on understanding the impact of resistance so that we understand the consequences and we are motivated to do something about it, both individually and collectively. And at the same time, um, try and see what has been happening in terms of interventional strategies, uh, the common things, and what could be done further by all of you and me as we move uh, fast towards a post-antibiotic era. Now, Therefore, I'd like to start with a story. And the story uh, took place a few years back, I, I would say probably around 12 years back. 
and um, it's a 65 year old lady um, who you know had just finished a, a, a knee uh, transplant surgery uh, implant surgery and uh, for one month she was absolutely fine and then just so happened that while she was recuperating uh, on a particular weekend she had a little bit of uh, cold feeling and um, the the relative who was uh, looking after felt that it might be some kind of a viral fever so uh, you know usually when you have a viral fever or you suspect a viral fever the first thing you give is probably a, a paracetamol tablet so that's what he did and then uh, subsequently the elderly lady uh, was okay for a little while and then again, she felt a little bit cold. Um, and then the third time, which is on a Sunday morning, um, the relative actually saw that the patient actually had very bad chills and was really feeling cold, but there was no real fever. Um, so the relative decided, okay, let's just take uh, her to the hospital. And this is a Sunday morning. So anyway, it took to the hospital, usually the outpatient department it doesn't work, there's no clinic, so, but you take to the casualty or the accident emergency. Um, fortunately, when we went to the accident emergency, they, they, they found somebody who, who knows them, and that always helps uh, a doctor uh, who knew them and asked them to come, come in. And then um, um, they asked the, old, the doctor asked the old lady, do you, do you have any other problems besides this chills and feeling cold? And the lady said, no, I don't have anything else. And then he asked, do you have any other previous problems or past problems of uh, any illness? And uh, the, the relative at that time stepped in and said, yes, she has high hypertension. Um, what was the kind of hypertension? We're talking about 220, 120, uh, controlled to around 200, 100 with medication. That's really high. So, um, the doctor said, okay, can I first check her blood pressure? And so he checked the blood pressure. Unfortunately, he could not get the blood pressure. He could not get a reading on the uh, sigmanometer. Uh, and he was shocked. So again, he checked the blood pressure. He just could not record the blood pressure. So for those of us in the medical line, when you get a blood pressure below 90 by 60 or 90 by 50, uh, we tend to call it uh, not just hypotension, um, but shock. The, the circulatory system is collapsing. And this is warrants a critical emergency situation which warrants a quick uh, admission, IV line, etc. So they, they rushed her to the uh, intensive care unit, which is nearby, put in the IV line, put in fluids, um, and by that time, of course, uh, I had to interview it and because she was rapidly going into shock. Now, the story doesn't end there. Um, uh, the investigations were done and the blood culture, which came after 48 to 72 hours, actually showed an organism. Um, and the organism, uh, when they did the susceptibility testing for antibiotics, found that it was actually the, none of the antibiotics uh, were working, all resistant. And um, unfortunately, only one antibiotic seemed to be working. And that was, at those days, it was meropenem, which was the last resort antibiotic available at that point of time. Um, and so rapidly started on meropenem three times a day, um, for the next 10 days, I think, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly. Now, um, that particular intervention saved the life of that patient, that at least one antibiotic was working, uh, that, that that antibiotic was available, and importantly, that the patient could afford that antibiotic. Interestingly, that antibiotic was 2,400 rupees per vial, three times a day is 7,200 rupees. And then if you multiply it into uh, 10 days, actually, I think the patient took it a bit more, 10 days, it's about 72,000 rupees, just for the antibiotic. 
let's forget, let's not, not even calculate the ICU costs, the other drugs, the investigations, etc. So the patient was just able to afford it. But actually, um, most patients um, in low and middle income countries will not be able to afford that. So even if the drug is available, even if it is effective, you will not be able to afford such, such reserve critical antibodies. Now that is a story which forever is etched in my mind because it shows how critical this problem of antibiotic resistance is. So with that, with that basic foundation of understanding that there is a huge problem out there, let me bring some evidence um, beyond the story. And this is a study that I did um, a few years back. And this study compared people of septicemia, uh, and if they are res so-called resistant to the empiric antibiotic versus susceptible to the empiric antibiotic. And uh, I, I showed that there was a median cost difference using the bootstrap uh, strategy of around 42,000 rupees between both the groups for one patient. Uh, this is highly significant, of course. And if you again calculate what does 42,000 mean, you might think it doesn't mean that much. But for uh, that point of time, in that particular year, the average daily uh, laborer's wage uh, as per the government was 95 rupees. Um, and in, if you divide, uh, if you take it as 100 rupees, 42,000 divided by 100. Okay, we're talking about 420 days. Okay, 420 is the 42,000 divided by 100. It's 420 days worth of labor, salary, money. And uh, just imagine a poor laborer having to shell out that much just because there's resistance to the antibiotic that was meant to save the life of that patient. And we're talking about more than a year and a half of wages. And that pushes that individual and probably the family into a catastrophic burden as far as the economics of it is concerned, as well as uh, probably pushes them into a debt trap, especially for those who don't have ready money available. So it's, but it's not just about cost, it's not just about the money. It's about the consequences of what happens in, in sepsis when, you know, when the, you know, everything is resistant. ICU admissions, much more in that group. Complications, much more in that group. Even the median length of stay was more than three days. Um, and of course, mortality was also higher. So, so you've got a situation where there, are, there is a cost involved and there are health consequences all because of a resistant bug, which is, you know, no antibiotics are working or only a few antibiotics are working. And so we do have a big problem on our hands um, because the consequences or the impact of such uh, a resistance could be longer duration. Yes, as you know, the initial antibiotic is not working, so you switch the antibiotic, et cetera. Uh, higher complications and mortality, as was mentioned, um, and of course, treatment with more expensive drugs. If, for example, cortrimoxazole was working for most uh, uh, bugs or bacteria, um, you know, we could probably do a, a course for very limited amount of money. Uh, but now we're ending up having to pay so much more because cortrimoxazole is just not working. Let's also not forget that there are other consequences which are not directly related to uh, a patient with an infection. Because we know that, you know, people who post-transplant who are, you know, immunologically uh, low may have infections and may need an antibiotic. Sometimes a post-surgical complication or infection, you need an antibiotic. We also know that patients could act as reservoirs of resistant organisms. So in a crowded atmosphere, just like you're seeing in COVID or uh, when the, you know, there's lots of beds um, in one ward, you know, they, they could actually be spreading. 
So there is definitely going to be an increased stress on the health system. And there's definitely, as we just saw, uh, a potential huge economic impact on individual and society. And um, we are now living currently, as we speak, in um, a pandemic age, if I can put it that way. So you understand on the TV, you can see it, on the newspapers, you can see it, the people around you, you can see it. What is the impact of a deadly pandemic, a deadly infection? Now, the antimicrobial resistance issue um, is in one way very similar. The only thing is you don't see the impact as visibly as COVID. Uh, people masks, et cetera, you know, that, that is a frightening thing. You don't see it because many times when somebody dies because all the antibiotics are resistant, it's not documented as a resistant, you know, issue. Rather, it died of pneumonia, died of sepsis, died of uh, some other infection, etc. And then thirdly, the visibility of the whole thing is very, very, very low. And therefore, and it's a slow, more slower issue rather than the pandemic, which is suddenly sprung on the world out of nowhere. So we've got this huge problem of a silent pandemic, which has been there in existence much earlier than the current pandemic, which is COVID. And it is going to be as bad, or my, my assumption and hypothesis, it's going to be much worse. We won't have a vaccine for AMR or ABR. And we have run out of effective antibiotics. There is research and development going on on some antibiotics, but at the rate which AMR is increasing, will we be in time is the question. And therefore, I think we have to do something about this. If we are to truly, truly um, minimize the impact of resistance. So who should help and how should we help? Where do we go? Uh, what kind of strategies are needed? These are the kind of questions that you should be asking yourself now, um, especially after seeing the impact and the consequences and the cost. So the most important thing in my opinion is to understand why it's happening. And one of the main contributory factors for the rising antibiotic resistance is antibiotic use. We can say um, overuse, we can say misuse, we can say inappropriate use, we can say irresponsible use, but the fact is that we are using a lot of antibiotics. And I'd like to point to two studies which I love to quote. Um, one is on an individual basis, Costello et al, um, who pub published this uh, systematic review of meta-analysis of what is the effect of antibiotic prescribing in primary care in individual patients. And in very interesting data, and I would like you to read it later at some point of time. Um, very interesting. If you take an antibiotic, there's a high chance, especially if it's broad spectrum, of wiping out the normal commensal. Uh, leaving behind the resistant bacteria, and that, of course, multiplies. And then, of course, to get that protective normal commensal back takes months. And so you're more vulnerable to infections. The second study, the outpatient use in a collective fashion in Europe, and showed a clear association with resistance. The more antibiotic you use, the more the resistance was rising, though there is a latent period, of course. So it's very clear as an individual, as a community or society, we have to be careful. It's not just about, oh, I should not take the antibiotics. It's about that the community should have appropriate use of antibiotics. So since there is a particular association here, we do need to use um, this whole issue of antibiotic use as a strategy for the way forward. And one of the most commonly used uh, strategies in uh, most hospitals at least is antibiotic stewardship, which is basically a program that encourages judicious use of antibiotics. And some of the main objectives of an ant antibiotic stewardship pro uh, program is, you know, try and make sure that the clinical outcomes are better, 
with better effect from the antibiotics, um, reduce toxicity, less side effects probably. And then of course, make sure that you don't give broad spectrum antibiotics unless absolutely needed, be narrow and focused, and therefore you reduce your um, resistance risk, as well as make sure that the appropriate uh, choice, the dose is correct, the route is right, uh, and of course the duration. Um, and of course, we used to have a tendency to give a long course of antibiotics. Now there are many more studies for um, you know, specific uh, infections give short courses. Um, at the same time, if you have a very complicated infection, you might have to give a long course. So we need to do it in an appropriate manner. And let's not forget that much of the world cannot afford proper uh, treatment, proper antibiotics, let alone have health access. So that also needs to be taken care of. Choose the antibiotics based on cost and affordability. And let's not forget that you can start anything you want in life, but you also need to know when to stop. So discontinuation of the antibiotic, changeover from parental to uh, oral, all are very important facets of antibiotic stewardship. So I thought it's important to really you know, see whether this actually works. So I took one component of antibiotic stewardship in a hospital, which is often what we call antibiotic policy or antibiotic guidelines. Some people even say the word policy guidelines. It is one of the major tools for antibiotic stewardship. The real question is, do they work? Um, and of course, there are many studies uh, throughout the world saying that they work. Uh, I wanted to see whether in our own you know, kind of situation in our own context with so many other challenges with uh, maybe pharmacy shops having antibiotics where patients can get it from, affordability issues, um, access issues, uh, whether the medicine itself is available. Those are all challenges. And so I just want to know whether, you know, truly antibiotic policy guidelines, do they work? So I did a study uh, at my own hospital uh, it's a not-for-profit tertiary care teaching hospital, which has outreach programs at a primary level. But here I concentrated mainly at the big tertiary care teaching hospital, which is uh, at that time it was around 2,700 beds. Um, and we had an antibiotic policy guidelines. Um, and uh, of course, where the first version, if I can put it that way, um, didn't seem to be working. We were not sure, so I did the study. So on the uh, y-axis, we have uh, the overall antibiotic use, which is uh, put into defined daily doses of the an antibiotics per 100 bed days. This is a, a normal uh, kind of unit measurement that we do use for aggregate studies um, in antibiotic use. Defined daily dose, I'll give you an example. Uh, amoxicillin, let's say if it's given 500 milligrams three times a day, the average maintenance dose becomes 1,500 milligrams per day. That's 1.5 grams. So they say that the defined daily dose, daily dose, uh, is 1.5 grams for amoxicillin. So if somebody gives, let's say in that particular clinic, 150 grams of amoxicillin in that day, let's say it's a small clinic, it's not a hospital, of course, then uh, 150 divided by 1.5 grams. I'll try and make it simpler. Suppose it is 15 grams. 15 grams divided by 1.5 grams is 10. So 10 defined daily doses of amoxicillin was given on that particular day. This is just a simple example of what I mean by defined daily dose, number of defined daily doses per heart. And in this particular situation, what we did was calculate the individual antibiotics over 10 years, okay, over 10 years, and then uh, looked at each antibiotic from a defined daily dose point of view, divided it by the average number of uh, patients based on um, bed occupancy, actually, and then you get 100 bed days, and added up all of them together. And this is a summary graph, which I wanted to show you. Um, which shows the increase in antibiotics, especially between 2002 and 2004. Um, and we decided we had to do something about it. So we actually um, 
we we tried to at in February somewhere just before that we had a series of meetings uh, where we got departments coming to the antibody policy committee and said, look, this is the problem. We're having a rising, rising antibiotic use and uh, shall we do something together about it? So every department started looking at um, their disease profile, what kind of antibiotics they're using, what should it be as per evidence, et cetera. And uh, they came up with their own suggestions. There were negotiations, first choice, second choice, third choice, and we put it together as a booklet. And this was released somewhere around February 2004 and widely um, you know, given to all the wards, to uh, all the departments, et cetera. And you can see that there is some element of uh, a reduction. And when I say reduction, at least the ascending uh, curve, if I can put it that way, or slope, uh, seems to have been arrested in this phase between 2004 and 2005, over those one and a half years. But you can see that towards the end, there was a slight rise and even in somewhere in the middle. So that just goes to show that no matter what you do, especially when you release a booklet, there is an initial enthusiasm. Uh, people see it, watch it. Uh, but remember, hospitals are a place where there's a rapid turnover of interns, nurses, doctors, um, and uh, things get forgotten. The booklet sometimes just remains on the shelf. People don't look at it again. Or there's a, a new consultant who wants to do things in this way, or a new challenge because um, antibiotics doesn't seem to be working, and therefore people just move along. So that is one problem that we face, and probably that was one of the reasons for a slight increase again towards the end of that phase. So again, you know, we, sorry, in the end of phase three, as you can see. So for a bit of time in phase two, this worked. But as we moved through phase three between 2005 uh, and 2008, it just went up and up and up. Now, we therefore, we all sat together and decided, let's revise the guideline booklet and uh, try and uh, look at the antibiotic a panel and the resistance patterns, et cetera, revise it. But this time, of course, we didn't call all the departments. We just got together and revised it based on all these factors. And again, released a revised booklet. And again, you can see how it sort of worked. It, again, it arrested the ascending slope uh, for a certain period of time. But we realized that, you know, we shouldn't make the same mistake uh, as, uh, you know, at the end of phase two where again, it moved up to in phase three. So by that time, of course, every ward had a computer, every uh, OPD had a computer in, uh, in front of the doctors. And even at our homes, we had uh, you know, online access. So we revised the guideline booklet again, based on the um, antibiotic um, use, the patterns and the panel and put it out into the open, not just the booklet now, but through the internet access, where everybody could access it at a drop of a hat. They don't have to go and search for the book. Um, they, you know, if they're at home and you know they they still there on their computer, etc. And that really helped uh, bring down that slope. In fact, it moved it in the opposite direction. So it can work, but not all hospitals have computers. Not all hospitals we were will be able to have cooperative departments or people willing to just look at the evidence and say, hey, we should do something about it collectively. So there are lots of challenges when it comes to guidelines, whether it's hospital guidelines, whether it's state guidelines, whether it's national guidelines or even international guidelines. So we cannot rely only on guidelines, though we can help to bring down the overall antibiotic use. And that's why we need to look at the WHO Global Action Plan and, of course, India's National Action Plan also, where there are five domains which are important. Um, one is we need to improve awareness and understanding. Um, this is important. Now, we tend to think that everybody knows about antibiotics. We tend to think that everybody knows about resistance. But actually, um, I was involved in a few studies and there are many more studies coming out saying that this, because of the huge turnover of population, 
people and because of the overload of information many of these kind of things get lost out so there is a constant need to improve awareness not just about antibiotic resistance but what is an antibiotic where is it needed uh, what is the difference between a viral infection and a bacterial infection and the treatment strategies for both um so these kind of things often get lost out in a busy opd where people don't have time and therefore all of us in the healthcare team whatever profession we are have that role the second uh, and please remember it's not just about awareness and understanding we need to move towards change of behavior and that itself is a totally different dimension and different uh, kind of challenge itself we all know how difficult it is to stop bad habits the second is of course we need to monitor what's going on what is the antibiotic use in a particular department in a particular hospital in a particular state in a particular region now of course surveillance um suddenly come to light with covid and of course you everybody including the media very much spotted on how much uh, you know covid numbers how many deaths how much so but in the same way the same passion and the same energy and the same intensiveness needs to be done for antibiotic resistance as well as antibiotic use the third is of course infection prevention and control we as a collective society need to improve hygiene basic hygiene and also uh, how to control infection and again covid is a great opportunity because suddenly it's come into the public light of how to do that we need to optimize and rational use of antimicrobials not no overuse no inappropriate use and last but not the least uh, i told you that antibiotics are you know many of them are not effective anymore most of the industry um has sort of moved towards greener pastures with chronic medication and therefore there's not enough research and development fortunately some players have come forward on a collective scale just like in vaccines to look at a collective good and see whether uh, we can get some new r&d going on antibiotic classes and antibiotics so that's the five domains of the global action plan of course the indian national action plan also has about coordination and leadership which is very important we are all leaders in the community and we need to do our part and we need to work with other sectors not just in human but beyond in the one health so keeping that in mind my plea to all of you listening here today is that we need to have a broader sense of stewardship it's not just at the hospital with antibiotic policy guidelines it can be in some of the realms that i've put down on the slide here whether it's in clinical services or education or training research clinical research public health governance and regulatory advice so let me just elaborate on some of these points that so that it will stimulate your minds and hopefully uh, give you the impetus and motivation to move into some of these areas on an urgent footing so as far as clinical services are concerned many of you work in hospitals uh so it's not just about antibiotic policy it's about do you have a drugs and therapeutics committee of course the olden term used to be uh, pharmacy and therapeutic committees now who says medicine and therapeutics committees but do you have a a a a group looking after medicine use including antibiotics could be an antibiotic policy committee also in your hospital and even if you have on paper is it functional are they monitoring medicine use um what is there overuse is there misuse um are there errors and these kind of monitoring services and feedback services through a group like the dtc is extremely important the second is standard treatment guidelines now of course again sometimes we have a plethora of standard treatment guidelines we have international we have national we have regional uh, state and then we have hospital sometimes department of course you need to stick to one or the other uh, and of course if you can sift through uh, some of them based on evidence that would be excellent but unless we use that uh, on a day by day basis as part of overall treatment strategies often we tend to think individually and say okay this is great that's not so great but is that evidence based we need to stick 
to the rational use principles. And I've talked about a little bit of that uh, as far as duration is concerned, as far as choice is concerned. Um, many a time, we may have seen many situations where um, just parental antibiotics are given where oral would have been enough, or very broad spectrum antibiotics are given where focus should have been given. So some of these things are very important. Applied kinetics, are we overdosing our patients? Are we underdosing our patients? Um, should we be giving a particular antibiotic which has concentration dependent kinetics as compared to time dependent kinetics? So aminoglycosides versus, for example, uh, beta lactams. And therefore, why are, why are these things important? Because based on that, if you're going to short, uh, you know, shorten a course for a time-dependent antibiotic, that could be a great risk as far as resistance is concerned. And then of course, so much stress needs to be there on infection prevention and control. I'm so happy that many hospitals are making use of that opportunity of this pandemic to actually boost their infection prevention and control. But let's remember that it's not just about clinical services, it's about education. And all of us, I don't know, some of you, maybe students at this point of time, some of you would have finished, but we need to go back into how we learned. And I feel that many a time we need to re reinvent education to make it much more integrated. But what do I mean by integrated? I mean that we tend to have subjects which are taught in isolation. Um, and therefore, let's say if it's pharmacology or pharmacy, for example, we learn the drug and it goes from one ear and goes out of the other ear and that's it. Instead, if we were looking at typhoid, for example, if we have a little bit of the microbiology followed by some of the clinical features by the clinical departments, followed by some of the pharmacology and put it together as a nice modular package, it will make so much more sense. And that is why when ultimately, uh, when the, we become physicians or other healthcare professionals, this crucial aspect of medicine use, I mean, it doesn't really get integrated into the mind. The second is real life learning. Most of us as students would have read the notes uh, and if at all the textbook, but that is, in my opinion, you need to move to the bedside if you really want to absorb a holistic uh, learning approach. And that is something that is again, very important when it comes to things like uh, antibiotic resistance, where we have to look at the whole picture of the patient before we decide on antibiotics and the risk of resistance. Experiential learning, you and I know that as soon as we come out from a degree and our first day of the job, we really know very little and therefore, every day is a learning experience right till the time we die. And unless we learn from our mistakes, correct ourselves, and keep improving and updating, often we remain static. And last but not the least, modular learning. I think we need to have now modules focusing on infection prevention, infection control, uh, certain aspects of stewardship, uh, certain aspects of um, kinetics, for example, where we break it down into small, simple modules with step-by-step -step approach, which would really improve all our training uh, and education in the, uh, in the area of antibiotic use, as well as resistance. So if you're a teacher and you're listening to this, I would urge you to move forward in that uh, thing. I remember doing a, a MOOC, a massive open online course with uh, uh, BSAC and University of Dundee, where we Concentrate on six modules. So it doesn't have to be a large number of modules. We kept it online. Uh, and people found it so useful from a modular learning approach. We also remember that, you know, none of us are perfect by the time we finish our degrees. And so therefore continuing aid education for physicians, pharmacists, nurses, even for the public are so important because drugs keep changing. I always tell my students, you know, anatomy may not change in a thousand to 10,000 years, but drugs, every day there's a new medicine coming out or a new dose or a new formulation, and we have to keep up to date. The approaches change, the evidence changes. Um, it was fortunate that we had uh, a specific workshop training course actually through the ICMR, and I call it ASPIC, for which I was a principal investigator, um, where we actually trained 10 uh, medical colleagues with uh, not just 
hands-on training, but with uh, a research project also in the area of antibiotic stewardship. And that proved quite useful. I think all of you can use that opportunity, that model for just the colleges around you or the hospitals around you and uh, try and get simple courses uh, where we can on stewardship and on uh, prevention infection control. Many of you may be into research, but I, my plea is that when we do research about antibiotic use or resistance, uh, especially about the use part, uh, we need to be sure that it is done in a very relevant manner with a clear objective, appropriate methodology, and of course, the uh, appropriate analysis. So some of the kind of research or studies we need to do as part of actually the uh, surveillance and monitoring also, if you, can, if you want to put it that way, are indicator studies where we look at uh, particular uh, prescriptions. Um, let's say you look at a, a particular unit and say, okay, they had 100 prescriptions today. How many of them had antibiotics? And uh, WHO has a very um, basic um, indicator study uh, in the, uh, criteria where it's not just about antibiotics, of course, it's about medicines. Uh, is it the right dose, is it the right uh, uh, duration, et cetera, but it also talks about antibiotics and whether it's injectable, oral, et cetera. But in a, from a purely surveillance point of view, it's very difficult to do very pinpointed uh, studies on a long-term basis. So you might have to do aggregate studies like the defined daily dose uh, example that I gave, uh, where it shows you know, what are the kind of uh, overall changes over a period of time. Sometimes it has to be in-depth. We have to understand why is it that people are doing or prescribing antibiotics. And therefore, you might have to go into the chart, a medication chart review, a drug use review, if I can call it that, uh, will give you the appropriateness of the antibiotic to the disease. And there you'll need to see the culture and the report. Sometimes you have to move much more beyond and look at qualitative studies, in-depth interviews, focus group discussions and see, hey, we know there's a problem because of the quantitative studies indicator aggregate in depth, but we need to understand why there's a problem. And uh, I found in some of my studies that I did that actually awareness is a big issue, but even more so practice and the perceived pressure that, hey, this patient might want an antibiotic and if I don't prescribe, they'll go to the next private practitioner. That is a big uh, you know, incentive to actually prescribe. Now, cost evaluation studies in our setting is equally important. And I think that's something that we need to look at uh, as we do many of these studies. Now, public health is now right into the public spotlight, if I can put it that way. But we'd be surprised that many people, health education is still very rudimentary. And we need to know about how to improve health. What kind of diet we need? What kind of medicines should we be taking long-term, short-term? I was so surprised that one when I was, this is many years back, 30 to 35 years back, when I was working uh, as a general practitioner for some time in a rural hospital, I saw a patient, uh, you know, it, she came for diabetes and I was going to prescribe the anti-diabetic medication. I just happened to ask, are you on any other medication? So she said, yes, I'm on some medication. And I expected it might be something for diabetes or hypertension, but no. She said, I'm on erythromycin. Oh, I said, I said, oh, did you have any fever? No, no, no. I've been on this for eight years. Now an antibiotic, you know, you know, you have a short course. You don't put somebody on for eight years. But just so happened that that particular patient did not know what erythromycin is for. She thought it was something for, um, that she had to take for long term. And she kept self-medicating by going to the pharmacy shop. So health education, medicine education is critical. We need to use the knowledge that we have and disseminate it, not just to our students or our juniors, but actually to the community around us. Otherwise, what is the point in gaining all that knowledge? We need to be able to communicate effective, simple messages to our policymakers so they also understand and show evidence. Hygiene I talked about, but let's not forget about pollution and waste control. Where do we dispose our medicines, our old antibiotics? Where does the pharmaceutical industry dispose? Fortunately, there are now been laws and there's been lots of 
um, good improvements in this area, but still there's a lot to do because you and I know that much of our water system could be having medicine waste in it. And of course, surveillance itself, monitoring of use, et cetera. This is an example of a antibiotic use surveillance that I did uh, over, uh, actually it was over two years, looking, um, looking at around 50,000 patients actually. And this was um, done, I'm just showing one year where we looked at um, antibiotic use in pharmacy shops, um, in hospitals, uh, even, even prior practice clinics. And you can see that there is, all, of course, sometimes a seasonal variation. For example, here you'll have a rainy season sometimes in this and therefore there could be more infections and you could have more antibiotics be used. But you could also see that some of the kind of antibiotics being used. For example, the green is fluoroquinolones. Now fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin, et cetera, ideally should not be used except for very specific conditions. But unfortunately, if you look at some of the drug advertisements and the way that it's pitched, even in our textbooks where fluoroquinolones have good permeation into all body tissues and fluids, therefore you tend to think, hey, it's a great drug. But the, it is a good drug. But the fact is there's a high risk of resistance um, and cross resistance. So actually it should be reserved for very specific um, uh, indications, including enteric fever. Of course, that's now become a big issue in terms of resistance. But you understand what I mean? It should not be up there like that. Um, and uh, of course, all the other antibiotics, there were ups and downs, et cetera. But this kind of surveillance picks up important things. So now we can start intervening. We ask, why is there so much of fluoroquinolone usage? And look at a strategy and intervention to actually decrease it. Now, the last part of my talk in the last uh, few minutes is about governance. What should there be in order to control antibiotic use? We talked about, I mean, the non-governance aspects like, uh, you know, behavior change, awareness, et cetera. But there has to be some level of governance. In hospitals, there's often standard treatment guidelines. Of course, laws have come in in terms of schedule age, prescription-only medicines. And of course, looking at antibiotics, specifically H1, where you need to have a prescription and that needs to be recorded uh, in a register uh, in order for that antibiotic to be prescribed. Of course, not just antibiotics. Then of course, people have come up with critically important antibiotics, such as life-saving, carbapenems. Um, now, of course, cholestin is there, vancomycin, linozolid. Uh, these are crucial because if nothing else works, they should be working. So we should not be misusing it for normal, simple infections. Um, and this is, in my opinion, critically important that all of us have a look at what are the critically important antibiotics. There are high critically important antibiotics, that are critically important, there are high priority antibiotics as it comes down. Talking about fourth and fifth generation cephalosporins, et cetera. Quality of antibiotics. We all know in many of our countries, there are issues with quality of drugs. Uh, and therefore, instead of, let's say 500 milligrams of amoxicillin, if you have only have 300 milligrams because of a quality issue or quantity issue, it could become a problem. And the problem becomes much worse, of course, if there is counterfeit. Fortunately, the Drugs Control Department does a very good job of monitoring many of these medicines. And therefore, um, you know, once in a while we see issues with uh, quality, but we need to keep that in mind, especially when we see a lack of effect. Hey, is there a quality issue here? Fortunately, our national action plan, and in some states, the state action plan has been um, you know, put in place and there have been efforts towards implementation. But it's not just those who've made the plan who have to implement it. All of us collectively as a society have to help uh, disseminate it and advocate it and implement it. In many of the hospitals which have national accreditation, there have been elements and components within the uh, uh, accreditation criteria which say, look, do you have a hospital infection control committee? Do you have um, an antibiotic policy committee? Show us some of the work you've been doing for stewardships. That's good. Government has stepped in as far as cholestin uh, for livestock is concerned and banned it. And that is an excellent uh, uh, measure by the government because cholestin was a banned antibiotic many, many decades ago, reintroduced because uh, even our life-saving antibiotics are now 
you know, resistant, and therefore we had to use cholesterol um, just to save a life of a patient. And now, of course, if it's going to be used in animals again, uh, there's going to be issues of resistance. So government has stepped in in a very wise way to ban cholesterol use in livestock. And similarly, we need to look at other antibiotics and say, what can we use in humans? What can we use in animals? So we need to remember that human health is one aspect, but we need to take care of our animals, the agriculture, the food that we eat, and the environment around us. Are there antibiotic effluents going into our water systems? What about the air? Um, where, what, what is happening in terms of um, where we dispose our antibiotics, uh, where we make our antibiotics. Uh, so what about surroundings of the hospital? All that is, in my opinion, and in the governments and in the WHO, so important if you really have to tackle antibiotic resistance in a holistic manner. So therefore, we need to act in various levels, at the level of the policymakers, the regulators, the hospital managers and leadership, the healthcare professionals, uh, other One Health professionals, farmers, agriculturalists, veterinarians. Let's not forget the media. They play an extremely important role, but we need to give them the clear messaging. We need to understand that a lot of uh, non-governmental organizations which work in public health and health, have they understood what AMR is? They know about HIV, they know about climate change, can we make them understand that and allow them to disseminate the message? And let's not forget our patients and public. It is not the strongest of species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to changes. So my request and challenge to you is, can you be responsive to the threat or challenge of antibiotic resistance and respond, adapt, and intervene so that we don't end up in a post-antibiotic era. Can we save the antibiotics that once saved us? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the interesting talk. Um, we have got uh, very so many questions, so I will try to take up the questions uh, one by one. Do you need a one minute of break, sir, meanwhile? Uh, sir, you're not no, okay. I'm fine, thank can you. you. I'm fine. I, we can continue. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so the first question is, as you mentioned, the cause of death is not reported as a resistant organism towards when in the beginning of your talk, right? So does that indicate the real number is too high than what is reported? The real number of deaths due to AMR? Yeah, so it, it's um, logical that if uh, if you're not reporting it, uh, there will be uh, the the numbers will be actually much lower. Now, of course, there have been efforts globally and uh, nationally to have um, the coding of um, the terminology of antibi antimicrobial resistance as part of the ICD-10 uh, coding. And I, I think that will definitely improve things in medical records. But now people have to be aware that there is such a code. Now, of course, you can't say, you know, let's say a patient dies of sepsis. Uh, we can't avoid the word sepsis. We still have to write that, yes, patient died due to sepsis. But it will be equally important to document that there was uh, an AMR issue there uh, along with that. So it gets into the system. Uh, and then, of course, the numbers you automatically will start increasing here. Nobody's you know, trying to hide anything. It's just that the coding system and the awareness of the coding system has to be uh, implemented in an active way. Thank you, sir. So the next, next question is, uh, we have accreditation like NABH accreditation for the hospitals. Uh, what are their role in influencing or for, to tackle AMR? Do they play yeah. any major role? So, see, in, in many situations, uh, we have, uh, let's say if you look at, you know, traffic on the roads, uh, we all know what is right and what is wrong. We, we know that we have to travel on one side of the road. We know that we have to wear a helmet if you have a two-wheeler, uh, but sometimes we don't do it. Sometimes uh, an external regulation or some kind of guideline is important uh, in order to change behavior. 
So similarly, there is a great role when we have accreditation, it's not just in the antibiotic use, but you can see that many of the accredited hospitals, um, they, they have vastly improved from where they were before accreditation, because there's an awareness in that hospital community that these are the things that we need to improve, then they push up towards it and they try and sustain it because they know that the next uh, inspection is coming up. So similarly, as far as antibiotic use and stewardship and infection prevention and control is, I think that accreditation has done wonders for the hospitals which have um, actually gone through the accreditation process. And uh, so I definitely think there is a role there. Uh, I also think that for those who haven't done it, we don't have to rely only on accreditation. We should be able to motivate ourselves to understanding the impact of resistance and move forward and not just wait for accreditation, but accreditation and the process of it does definitely speed up things in improving stewardship and infection prevention control. Okay, sir. So the next question is, um, considering the general public who are not from a science background, how can we train them on AMR? Like what are the methods that we can yeah. apply? So we, we need to be careful here that, you know, saying things in a simple manner is an art form by itself, right? Not all of us know Shakespeare, not all of us know all the kinds of things that we learn in school. Um, and uh, people are very simple and they need to understand things in a simple manner before they get confused. So the, one of the things that we need to, uh, once we get the evidence sorted out, um, and we need to simplify that in basic points with effective messages. For example, if I say that uh, we should not be using uh, ciprofloxacin, um, let's say for typhoid, okay? And now I've got to make somebody understand what is typhoid. I've got to make somebody understand what is ciprofloxacin. I got to make somebody understand what happens if we use ciprofloxacin for some other, let's say a respiratory infection, and therefore what is the consequence? So it's not an easy process, but I think we all need to start choosing individual infections uh, where there's a burden in your hospital or uh, in the public or in the community. Um, and we look at what are the antibiotics being used or what are the medicines being used? And we look at what is the evidence uh, and then try and simplify it. So we might need somebody from a healthcare professional to be on that team. We might need somebody uh, who is in the community to say, look, I don't understand what you're saying, even if you simplify it. So that feedback system is there and then bring it to very simple messaging. Um, and I can tell you also that it's not just about the disease and the medicine. It's about overall health. Suddenly, of course, we are now faced with a situation in today's world where it's not just a lack of information or uh, you know, knowledge, but sometimes it's over information, it's disinformation. Uh, and we need to be able to distill what is right and what is wrong. And you and I know that uh, once COVID struck, all kinds of information was there about what kind of medicines or dietary supplements and so many other things were out there, which is true, which is false, uh, which needs to be followed, which does not need to be followed. So all of us need to, pick and choose based on what is our local context is, hey, this is the problem. This is what people are not aware of. Let's try and get a simple message in the local language, understanding the local customs in the local context. Uh, sir, we have a question from Dr. Sangeeta. Can you share your insights on formal infectious disease training for clinical pharmacists in India? Okay, so uh, for many, many years or decades, um, I can say that the antibiotic uh, resistance uh, discipline, if I can put it that way, or field, was under the purview of microbiologists. Now, with this gradual awareness of this whole holistic issue of antibiotic resistance, the Global Action Plan, the National Action Plan, everybody has suddenly realized that uh, even within a hospital, uh, the poor microbiologist who was working, uh, you know, so hard to change people's behavior, they themselves can't do it. It needs a multidisciplinary team, the microbiologist, the clinical pharmacist, 
the, uh, if there's a pharmacologist, a pharmacologist, the infectious disease physician, the uh, infection control nurses, um, even some of the managers and the leadership. Uh, there are many more uh, players here. So um, all of them need to have, they may have their own uh, knowledge and training from their own background, but they do need to have some element of infectious disease training. And uh, some institutions I know of have actually started that. So uh, for infectious disease training for clinical pharmacists, for example, very specific modules for six months, one year, etc. So that has started, and I think that's a good step forward. Uh, and I believe that um, clinical pharmacists, especially, have an extremely important role in being part of that uh, team. If you really need to improve things on the ground. Uh, okay. Uh, so one last question. Uh, Miss Bina Verma has asked. Uh, use of antibiotics in animals also play a major role in AMR. So they can be transferred through food as well to uh, humans. So how can we curb this problem? So there have been various efforts um, uh, from 2015 onwards or 2014 onwards, and then the Global Action Plan came, where everybody suddenly realized, hey, this is not just a problem in humans. We need to do something about it in animals, in food, in agriculture, and later, of course, the environment came in. So the WHO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, and the OIE, which is the World Animal Organization, uh, which is headquartered in France, came together. This became known as the tripartite. tripartite. And uh, they then had a, a series of meetings and that percolated down into the national action plans uh, and so there are each now each group is trying to in, have intervention strategies catered towards their own uh, pillar, if I can call it. that. Uh, this includes biosecurity measures. This includes monitoring. This includes looking at ba banning certain uh, antibiotics. But what has also happened in each country is that there has to be intersectoral coordination between sectors. And that is going on as we speak. It's, it's been a challenge in many countries, I must admit. But uh, in order that there, ha there is a holistic mo movement forward, uh, including food, for example, uh, there has also been a lot of advocacy uh, challenges. So for example, we know that antibiotics are used in um, some of the uh, uh, meat we use, some of the agriculture that we use. And there have been a lot of advocates trying to reduce that antibiotic. And some companies have actually moved forward and say, we have, for example, an antibiotic free chicken and they've declared that and it's been tested. So that moment is starting to happen, but we need to be much more advocative in that in our own countries. Thank you, sir. We are getting more and more questions. So one final question, sir. Uh, we have students from nutrition and dietetics who are attending this webinar. So according to you, how can they contribute to reduce the antimicrobial resistance? Is there, do they have any direct role? Yeah, I think, personally, I think we do have direct roles. Um, it's just that we need to find what is our niche and what is our group. So, um, for example, as, I, as, uh, as if you do uh, uh, look at an analysis of food and the kind of food we eat, uh, for example, uh, uh, those who eat non-vegetarian, for example. Um, there have been various instances of food analysis which show um, hormones, uh, which show um, antibiotics. Now, for example, um, I do remember when in a focus group discussion a long time back um, where there was a lot of cholesterol use in some of our uh, you know, uh, food products. Um, and I don't want to name it as such, but now, when it comes to nutrition and balanced diet, et cetera, there is a huge role in infection prevention. Uh, and if we have a balanced diet, you'd be surprised that there's enough studies to show that if we have a balanced diet and nutritious diet, many of our infections would be avoided. Uh, and so in that sense, we can actually prevent an antibiotic being used. And it's not just about food safety or contamination with an antibiotic. Uh, there is a whole aspect of prevention for health uh, reasons that if, you, if you're not going to be fall prey because of a malnutrition or a Ill, Ill balanced diet, 
you'll be avoiding an antibiotic straight away in the way that you know usually is practiced. So they do have their roles, but we just need to keep it in perspective and come from the uh, try and see what is their role. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the lively webinar. And as mentioned before, the recorded version will be available on the official website of Preventive and the social media handles. So before winding up, sir, uh, like the Charles Darwin quote that you mentioned to us the last is something that catch our attention always. So do you have any message to share with our audience? No, I think that um, my message is that we can't just sit by idly anymore. This is a silent pandemic. It's a long pandemic. Some of the impacts and, uh, which I've showed you is going to be so huge that uh, what we're seeing in the current pandemic will be minuscule as compared to it. And we need to think of our children. We need to think of this earth uh, from a holistic point of view. So I would urge you to start uh, in some way or another, take a small step. It's going to be a challenge because many people say, hey, what is this? Uh, you know, we don't even, have not even heard about it. But if you don't take that step, who will? You have been given the knowledge and you've been, now I, hopefully I've been able to motivate you. Now it's up to you to start small. There's enough material out there. There's enough people to uh, guide you. Uh, it's just a question of finding it on the net and finding it around you. And if you can just take that small step, you'll find that, a small success will bring you on to the next step. And together, I think we can save the antibiotic that once saved us. That's my final message. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, participants. Uh, let's meet next month with another interesting topic. Till then, take care. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.